Hello and welcome. This is the Onside Kick, a podcast and vodcast brought to you by Fox Sports Australia. I'm your host, Chris Jansen, and with me, as always, my good friend, Ted Smith. How are you doing, Teddy? I'm good, Christopher. That's good. Week five action. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Happy birthday for last week, mate. Oh, thank Happy you, birthday. mate. Uh, it was a lovely day. Um, it was just before the restrictions got eased, so we weren't able to celebrate in maybe the complete typical fa- uh, fashion, but it was not. Elaborate. What would be the complete typical fashion, mate? We'd be love to you know, <laughs> go out to some kind of establishment or something like that. Or, oh, okay. For our international listeners who are unaware, uh, Australia is still participating in lockdowns around most of the country. Starting to ease. Starting to ease. Starting to get there with uh, good vaccination rates. So, yeah. If you're into that kind of thing. Yeah. Which we both are, just to clarify. <laughs> As always, we will run through the best action uh, from Week Five's games, and we'll talk about some of our Aussies and how they fared across their games as well. Uh, and then we'll bring you a few of the games that are coming up for Week Six, which have uh, taken our attention. Um, moving in to the Week Five action, we can jump straight in, I think. Uh, the first game of the week, which was Thursday night football, Friday night, uh, Friday morning, our time. Go the Rams. The Los Angeles Rams travelled to Seattle to take on the Seahawks. Uh, Rams coming off a loss, obviously. A few question marks starting to float around them. You were remaining confident, spreading maybe the famous Aaron Rodgers, R-E-L-A-X. No need to stress just yet. What did you What did you think? This was a pretty commanding performance, I thought, mostly from the Rams. They looked much more comfortable. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't. As, as soon as Russell Wilson went out with what ended up being a ruptured tendon in his finger, it was over, as well as Geno Smith played. Uh, but it, it just feeds into what we were talking about this time last week heading into that game, was that the Rams have it over, Pete Carroll and the Seahawks, now including playoffs. I, be, I believe it's 8-3 to three, uh, in the Rams' favour. So um, for, for the Seahawks, the best thing to come out of this game was the fact that Geno was capable in mm-hmm. relief. And the Aussie kicker getting the, the, it's so rare. The player that it's night. so rare that no one knew what was going on. For five minutes the commentators were like, he he, he can't, can't do he, that. He can't kick it twice. <laughs> or he kicked it twice. And he got a massive punt on it. So so good on the Aussie punters, of course, Wishnowski coming off uh uh special teams player of the week a couple of weeks ago. Um so they're killing it, but in regards to this game, uh the Rams really needed this win. Um they, they went the Bucks, the Cards, the Seahawks. Uh, if you can go two and three from from that uh, slate of games, then you know uh, most of the questions that that are uh, being asked are being answered by the Rams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Gino will be able to do enough of a job in the coming weeks. Where if they're playing not super strong teams, they'll be able to take uh, a few W's hopefully with him, which is all they need. You know, if if Russell misses four games and they go two and two in that period. That's enough. The problem is if this team does need a massive upheaval going into the off season, because it's like, let's be realistic, you're not going to catch the Cardinals. Mm. You just showed you, you're outmatched by the Rams. And I think, gun to my head, I'd, I'd pick the 49ers over the Seahawks today. So wow. um, is it a rebuilding year for the Seahawks already? Is Pete Carroll the answer going forward? He's like 176 years old. So... And I think he's also the GM. I don't know if they can sack him, although they may need to. So uh, very interesting story out of the teams that probably won't uh, showcase in January. On the Rams side of things, though, Stafford uh, got back to a better performance. And Henderson, I Henderson think, looks good. Looks really impressive. Uh, Robert Woods, your man Bobby Trees. Well, well, that's the thing. The, the week leading up to the game, uh, they said they're going to try and feed Robert Woods and Seahawks must have looked at that and thought, liars. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, Spoken oh, mirrors. 150 yards receiving um, on a season that's been dominated by Cooper Cup on that end. Uh, yeah, good to see that the two-headed beast has returned for the Rams. It just proves that, yeah, okay, if you want to put your best defensive uh, player out on Cooper Cup, then we've got Robert Woods and if not him, JC Jackson, and if not him, Van Jefferson. Can and Tyler Higby's a, a serviceable tight end as well. So I think that, that Rams pass game, it's going gonna... it's to, it's an interesting formula, right? Let's really focus on offense and then we'll just get, I don't know, the best defensive tackle and then the best cornerback <laughs> and see what happens. And hopefully we can cause, but they're getting stops as well as the thing. It's not, yeah, it's like, yeah. Sean McVay is rolling. Another team that is rolling is uh, the other, 
Los Angeles team, the Chargers, who played, I'm going to call it the game of the year so far uh, for me. When you have almost 100 points in a game, I think it's deserving of being considered um, one of the best games of the year. I'm talking about the Chargers at home to the Cleveland Browns, 47-42. There were crazy stat lines across the board, which I think happens when there's 100 combined points. Someone's going to have to get a shitload of yards. Yep. Uh, to uh, speak in some nice French. But yeah, Justin Herbert, super impressive. Almost 400 yards and four touchdowns. Crazy. They, they, as you've mentioned a few times on this pod, they're making a habit of those close games that used to go against them. And this was such a perfect example where Cleveland still had chances at the end and the Chargers held tough, caused those fourth quarter turnovers, um, fourth down stops and things like that. And the Chargers are looking like a, the real deal. It's what a franchise quarterback is. It's someone that can come in and not be weighed down by the history of the franchise that they're about to take over uh, because it hasn't burdened him at all, not since he's come into the league. Look at the rookie quarterbacks this year that have come into the league. It kind of puts it in perspective how, how good Herbert was last year uh, because he, he was a starter from the moment he took over Tyrod Taylor and he hasn't looked back. Uh, the scary thing about... This game, it's actually on the Brown side. This is the highest scoring game since uh, the Browns uh, got beat by uh, the Ravens last year by the exact same score, 47-42. Wow. And, and on Sunday, Baker Mayfield uh, lost his third game in which his team had scored 42 points. No other starting NFL quarterback has done that in the history of the NFL. And the thing is that we expect the Browns to lean on their defense, right? Uh, it just goes to show, um, Greg Rosenthal has been saying it on, on the Around the NFL podcast for a while. You can have a good defense, but a good offense is always better than a good defense. The, the Browns have been a dominant defense this year in patches. Uh, just think of the Vikings where they, they go to Minnesota, they only score 14 points and they win the game. Mm. This week they score 42 points and they lose. Um, so... Uh, Another thing it shows is how up and down this season can be. It is a week-to-week -week league, but it is, it, is, it is exciting. And this game, pick a more exciting game. Yeah. You do feel bad for the Browns. They had such an incredible offensive performance. In fact, they were the first team ever to have 500 yards uh, and score 40-plus points. The first team in NFL history to lose after racking up those two stats. They also had zero turnovers. First team with that combination to then go on to lose, which is mind-boggling and proves how good the Chargers were offensively as well. Yeah, it's, it's watch this space for the Browns. But in saying that, as much as we've heaped on this loss for the Browns, if the Chargers are one of the uh, one of the boss dogs of the AFC, then the Browns have to be right there as well. The next game of considerable note was Sunday Night Football. Um, the Buffalo Bills travelled to Kansas City uh, in the repeat of last year's AFC Championship game where the Chiefs got the job done. In fact, I think last year it was also in Kansas City, that game, this one as well. Um, Buffalo travelled in there off the back of a few extremely strong defensive performances um, and they continued to look incredibly strong. The thing that I will say that was most noticeable about this game for me, Bills taking it 38-20, to 20, was that the Chiefs' defence is horrible. There is no other way around it. A lot of it's Buffalo's been horrible for ages. A lot of <laughs> a lot of Buffalo's drives were less than five plays and they would go the length of the field and finish with a touchdown. Another thing was the Bills, their touchdowns came from Josh Allen rushing one and a defensive or special teams touchdown. They didn't score a single touchdown through two their two relatively strong running backs or Stefan Diggs, they score them through these other means, which is should be terrifying to other teams that they do not need these typical superstars they have. They can find touchdowns and points in any way. Well, they they look like the most complete team in football at the moment. I know they've had the loss. Arizona are undefeated, but um, Arizona struggled against a busted 49ers team where the Bills went into Arrowhead Stadium and... It was a non-contest, man. Mm. Like when uh, when Josh Allen rushed for their first touchdown, it was like, well, 
that was easy. And Kansas City, they they struggled to move the ball at times. Now, I was watching this game and a few things crossed my mind. Now, I'm not going to say these things are facts, but these things crossed my mind. Now, obviously, uh, Pat Mahomes just signed his massive extension in the offseason. Is, is this another example of when quarterbacks sign their second contract, the team falls off a cliff? Um, think of Jared Goff's extension in an LA. LA. Uh, think of uh, Joe Fluco after they won the Super Bowl. He crippled that team ca- uh, from a cap perspective. Mm. To a lesser extent, think of Kirk Cousins, uh, the big contract he got at Minnesota and how that team hasn't been a- able to improve. Um, is it a case of that? Is it a case of Pat Mahomes subconsciously being a little bit switched off? He's, he's won a Super Bowl. He's been a back-to-back. He's won an MVP. He literally just signed for half a billion dollars. I would understand if that razor sharp edge of his competitiveness isn't quite there yet, even though I'm sure he thinks he's trying his hardest. Mm-hmm. Um, I imagine I'd be a bit chill if I'd signed a half a billion dollar <laughs> contract. I don't know if I'd be as sharp uh, yeah. as I was uh, – as I needed to be to get to that point. So because it's not just that he got played, that Pat Mahomes got outplayed by Josh Allen. It's the gap. Mm. It's the space. It's how much better Josh Allen was better than Pat Mahomes and how much better the Bills were better than the Chiefs. You try not to get taken to, taken away too much by, by one result, but this result was massive. And given the time of the year that it happened, we're entering week six. We've got a solid sample size now. It's been five weeks, and mm. Buffalo just absolutely smashed Kansas City. We'll have to see uh, how the picture looks when the dust settles. But at the moment, the Chiefs are two and three, and it doesn't look good for that team. There has been a lot of criticism around Mahomes. And while I can agree that maybe his prof- he's always going to be professionalism, but maybe that edge is slightly been a little bit chipped from what happened last year, maybe the way they lost the Super Bowl. But I think what's most important to consider is that offensive line for the Chiefs is almost completely new, be it from rookies they've brought in, free agents they've brought in, or players moving from one position in the line to the other. And I think you can see that, that Mahomes doesn't feel comfortable still. I think that's fair because the margin between the Bills and the Chiefs, like you said, is more considerable than we think. But I think you have to believe that the Chiefs have been so dominant with a good coach and all these skill players. As soon as they can get that offensive line right and they can give Mahomes more protection and as soon as they can do, you know, anything, yeah. offer anything on defense, they're going to be a team that's going to beat at least 60, 70% of teams in this league. Yeah, probably. Next game worth mentioning was Green Bay traveling to Cincinnati to take on the Bengals where they needed <laughs> overtime and about eight different field goal attempts for this game to finally be settled. Joe Burrow looked impressive. Aaron Rodgers looked impressive. Green Bay edged it finally when Mason Crosby remembered how to do the one thing he has to do in football. Yeah. Uh, it, it was wild. With There's only twenty, a bit over 20 seconds left in the fourth quarter. From that period, with 20 seconds left, they missed five straight field goals, five straight kicks. Um it was, it was, this is off the top of my head. It was, the, this weekend was the most missed field goal since 1987. And it was the most extra, most missed extra points in NFL history. Wow. And this, and this, out of all the games where kickers struggled, this is the one they struggled the most. <laughs> this was the pista resistance. <laughs> now we, we can talk about how good Aaron Rodgers was, uh, especially hooking up with his main man, um, in Jones, uh, or we can hook about Burrow hooking up with his man, my man Chase. Yeah, but he, the the story was uh, the missed field goals, without a doubt. Yeah, um, uh, Crosby got home in the end, and and one other thing I'll say about this game because we still got quite a quite a, a lot of other things to talk about. Everyone heaps shit on Aaron Rodgers over the over the off season and after week one. Um, every time he slips up, he tells us to relax, and every time we should listen. <laughs> uh, the the man the man is a magician out there. Um, Since he are no scrubs, you know anymore to go into no. Cincinnati and and beat that. S- team similar, to what we'll, in- similar to what we're talking about with Herbert. It's a, a franchise quarterback. He's someone that can come in and not be weighed down by the burden of the history of that franchise. And Joe Burrow, similar to San Diego, a lot of negative history there. Um, but 
One other thing is that he got absolutely walloped in this game, and it was like, oh, my God. Like, do you not remember what happened last year, <laughs> Bengals? Like, you need to protect this man. I know this one was a bit different. He was trying to rush for the first down. Yeah. But, man, uh, that would have ended some humans' lives. That was a big hit. The kicks uh, were the story of the game, though, and that moment where – McPherson uh, for the Bengals. Oh, when he celebrated? The rookie. The poor rookie. And the thing was, when they showed the split of it, and you could see that it's going perfectly down the middle, and then he turns and celebrates, and you can see one of his teammates is sort of new. looking new. over his still shoulder. Hugged him, but still hugging him. Oh. The flag flips yeah. in the breeze. Yeah. Oh, it was. Um, and then the fact that he turned around and tried to remonstrate with the umpires. Like, yeah. no, mate, it went through. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and his argument after the game, he's like, no, I... I hit it sweetly. It's like, oh, it, it missed. And you still need that Curb Your Enthusiasm music playing when you do that celebration, brother, because that, that shit was hilarious. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah. And then afterwards, there was this lovely moment which which got shared everywhere of Crosby and McPherson. You know, normally it's the two quarterbacks go and meet in the middle, and that's what gets highlighted. It was McPherson and Crosby. And I could just imagine Crosby standing there saying like, Look, mate, if you want to be in this league as long as me, don't play like we did today. Yeah, yeah. And just, mate, quick tip, just celebrate the ones that go through. <laughs> it's not AFL, mate. No points for missing. He, he drive away. When are we going to get into it, mate? When are we going to get into the Raiders? We're going to get into the good stuff? Yeah, look, we, we don't have to even necessarily talk about that game. Uh, it was a byproduct of the much bigger story which came out before that game, which was the email scandal. Uh, I'll bring us up. I'll give us up some facts for the people who don't know that. And then I'm sure you've got a, a lovely tangent you want to go into about this. But as part of the Washington football um, investigation for Dan Snyder and the sexual assault allegations that have been going on at the Washington football team. That's Washington football team's owner? Yes. Um, uh, roughly 650,000 emails were investigated. Uh, from there and then as it turned out a bunch of them were sent from um, Bruce yes uh, what's his full name oh, I could only remember Bruce <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the uh, the Washington the former Washington owner between him and John Gruden in which John Gruden had said uh, Bruce Allen Bruce Allen racist and sexist uh, things including uh, racial stereotypes homophobic like, racist misogynistic it's like Ding, ding, ding. I think uh, Stop the fight. It's over. I think Schefter summarized it best when he said it was the complete smorgasbord of offensive terms yep. uh, or something along these lines. Uh, there are a few things worth considering for this from my point of view. In fact, it's a hit job. A what? It's a hit job. On John Gruden? Yeah. Like, he, like what he did was worse. He needs to get punished, but this is a targeted hit job which is very interesting. You drop the number, 650,000 emails. They picked out this bunch on John Gruden, right? Uh, and it, it looks like, sorry to steal, steal the ship here, man. It, it looks like the Vegas Raiders were given all the in information on John Gruden on Friday. And it looks like the NFL were kind of like, sack him. And when they didn't, when they let him coach by Sunday, they they released the rest of it to the public. Mm. But given John Gruden addressed uh, Goodell in his presser on Friday or Saturday, and the emails about Goodell hadn't gotten to us yet, yet he'd, he'd read them, mm. right? Which means that Vegas probably had all that info. They didn't just have the Michelin Tires email, which is, mate, it's it's so sh it's so shit. It's such a bad call. It's heaps racist. It's it, it ties into Jim Crow, and it's not it's not at all clever or smart. It's just dumb racism. But uh, yeah, g given that the Raiders probably had all this information that we weren't privy to until Monday, it's like he shouldn't have coached Sunday. I think this is the start. I think these emails are a lot of emails to, to go through. Yeah, are going to uncover a lot and about a lot of different people. The thing that I think needs to be stressed uh, and considered from the audience is that this wasn't a few emails. Okay, it wasn't that he sent one email back in 2011 or 2014 or whatever people like quoting at the moment. This was taken from a seven to eight year period, and that's because that was the only seven to eight year period they had access to. I would be confident that if you looked more recently, 
These aren't isolated incidents. These things were still happening. And I have a feeling that in the next few weeks, when more of the emails start to get released and people start to see more of the details, it's going to become much more obvious on about, why... About John Gruden? Or, yes, on okay. John Gruden, on why this is a non-event. Like, there was absolutely no choice in my mind. And I think it sets a good example because every other coach around the league immediately starts to think, oh dear, oh, what, what email at one point or other in my life have I sent? And I think that's because now we live in an age of accountability. You cannot get away with doing things like that. Publicly, it doesn't matter if you're a great bloke and all of the players respect you. If you talk to your buddy buddies, be it behind closed doors or in front of a microphone, you cannot get away with acting like that in 2021. Yes, it happened in the past, but that doesn't excuse the fact that it happened and nor does it change the fact that it probably, behind closed doors, is still happening. Uh, uh, yeah. It's like, oh, it was 10 years ago. The dude was 48 10 years ago. He was a f- he, he, he knew who he was, who John Gruden was. His friends, especially the ones privy to these kind of emails, knew who John Gruden was. What has made him change over the last 10 years? He was working with Tariqa on Monday night football, standing next to a black man every Monday night and then going home and writing these emails. Fast forward to the press conference on Friday and he tells us he doesn't have a racist bone in his body. This is the problem, man. Larger than football, right? In one of the most racist countries in the world, you've got a bunch of people who are convinced they're not racist and then go home and write this kind of shit. Mm. It's a problem, dude. And this isn't... People want to get on their high horse and say, oh, this is cancel culture going too far. This isn't cancel culture. The NFL did not have the power to fire John Gruden. They couldn't come out exactly. and do that. This was the Oakland Raiders have looked at this information. and uh, Sorry, the Las Vegas Raiders have looked at this information and they've said, this is not the direction we want to go in. This is not who we want to have representing us. We probably don't have the power either to fire him because it was sent from a personal email and they were private emails to a friend. You know, it wasn't anything from the organization. But now that that, is, that laundry has been well and truly aired... Well, I feel the NFL... Or who, whoever whoever was leaking this, they they gave the, the New York Times the rest of the information because Davis still hadn't sacked Gruden. Mm-hmm. They forced his hand. Now you have to sack him. It's it's sad, and even more importantly, what this is all about, what this boils back to, is this Washington football investigation. There's going to be. I want those emails. There's going to be serious repercussions. What you just touched on as well, which is now coming out, Gruden had been a part of that. Allen sending photos, uh, allegedly, we should say at this point, of the cheerle- <laughs> of the cheerleaders, um, topless or posing or whatever, to be sending that sort of thing around, and that's just one of the points in this long list of uh, sexual misconduct which has been claimed against that organisation. The scary thing is John Gruden might actually believe that he's not racist, that he's not misogynist, that he's not homophobic. And it's like, man, you got... That's the problem. This will linger on. Um, It's going to be difficult. My heart goes out to the... uh, Particularly Nasib and the other black players in the team for what they must be thinking right now. To have had someone like that so close to you that you trust, this is just another punch in the gut particularly when the NFL, at least on surface level, has been trying so hard in recent years uh, to come out and, and change this sort of scope to now see this again. It's just yet another example of how much more work still needs to be done on the topic. Let's uh, move on to something a little bit more lighthearted for the people now, which is, of course, we must mention our beloved Australians uh, and how they fared week to week. You touched on it a bit before, so I might jump straight in with that, which was, and I love this, every time it happens, the American audience losing their mind when a punter does something besides punt. And every time it's an Australian and we watch this, you know, you saw Dixon pick it up with one hand and everyone was like, oh, the old one-handed scoop, mate. (laughs) Yeah. It's just easiest way to get the ball off the ground without having to stoop fully down. And the commentators are blowing their minds at this point. They're arguing about the rules, what's acceptable. And the whole time, Dixon's just standing there with that cheeky, larrikin, Aussie smile on his face, just like, yeah, mate, this is what we do. (laughs) Uh, he also he had four punts throughout the game, all four inside 20, including that one, which seemed to roll about 
<laughs> Did we get any clarification on whether that was a legal kick? I'm pretty sure he was in ahead of the line of scrimmage. That's just a Rams fan talking now. I I, <laughs> I also thought he was ahead of the line of scrimmage. By two metres. And I'm still not to this point sure if they ever actually clarified if you are allowed to well, it's, twice in the same The commentators like didn't know, so that, that's why we still don't know. There was no communication. Uh, but either way, a great heads-up play um, brings good attention to the fact that we have Australian punters in there who can do these things because, you know, they're multi-skilled. Yeah. They're athletes. Uh, someone who came back from injury as well was Jordan Mailata. They moved him this week for the first time to right tackle. Um where when I got deep diving in some Philadelphia fan forums, they reckoned he was a little bit less effective, actually. Yeah. Um, Philly gave up two sacks on the day. They were both on his side on back-to-back plays. Um, but there was a neat story where they came off the field and Hertz and Mylata had a chat. And Hertz said, it doesn't matter. I trust him. Just the next play, baby. Which seems like as long oh, as... Hertz, Hertz is a leader, man, for sure. And for sure. there's good rapport between those two going forward with Mylata now on a huge long-term contract. That can only be positive. I'm not saying Hurts is a top-end quarterback, but he's definitely a leader. Uh, looking at his college career and um, the fact he's been able to hold, hang on to the Philly, Philadelphia starting job um, for the last couple of seasons, just given the turmoil mm. uh, around his selection. Adam Gotsis continues to rack up tackles uh, for the Jacksonville Jaguars as well as losses. He's had a sack this year, I think. Was it last week or the week before? Uh, it was last week. Had his Well, I think he got half a sack, but yeah, got yeah. credited to half of it. Um, Aaron Sipos in that game for Philly as well. Good day punting, six punts, 46-yard average. Mitch Wisnowski uh, and Cam Johnson, probably two of the worst Aussie punter performances so far. Uh, Cam Johnson, unfortunately, I'm going to give our worst punting performance of the year to, who had three punts uh, for a 33-yard average and only one inside 20, which is rookie numbers. You got to pump those numbers up. Yeah, get out. (laughs) But we love him because he's Aussie and that's all that matters. Okay. Thursday night football, uh, we just talked about our Aussies. They're in this game, the Philadelphia Eagles at home to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, coming off the back of Tom Brady's Biggest ever game in his career. The first time, as in statistically, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like it kind of is. But, I mean, he's thrown for more touchdowns and he's thrown for more yards. But the combination. Yeah. To be to hit 44 years old and for the first time in your life hit 400 plus yards and five touchdowns. Was that the stat? Yeah. That's, that's outrageous. Yeah, and that, and that ties into the problem for this uh, matchup for Philadelphia. They won't be able to keep up. Mm. <laughs> yeah. If it's going to come down to a game that's a shootout of offense versus offense, how are the Eagles? Uh, well, going to, how are the Eagles going to match the Buccaneers? If they're going to win this game, let's play it that way. Um, it, it's got to be in the trenches. Um, that's where Tampa Bay have been a little bit um, subpar in comparison to their Super Bowl year last year, and it's one of Philadelphia's strong suits. So, uh, if if they can win, uh, win where it all starts, right in the middle. Then, then maybe they've got a chance and Jalen Hurts plays out of his skin. Um, as we've as we've seen this year, it, it is hard to predict a lot of things that happen in this league, but this game on paper, it screams big bucks win to me. Even with the Eagles at home? Short week, mate. Yeah. Who would you rather a short week? Like second, third year Jalen Hurts or 20th year Tom Brady? Mm. Man. Uh, I'm not even going to pretend to play devil's advocate on this one. I just agree with you. The Bucs yeah. are going to win. Um the Eagles have looked better, you know. They, oh, they continue to each week on week they continue to show signs that they're Okay, you have them. I'll pick the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Uh all right, let me move away from that quickly before I become a Philadelphia Eagles fan against my will. Uh, uh another matchup that jumped out to me was the Baltimore Ravens at home to the visiting Los Angeles Chargers. Um both, both what a game. quarterbacks coming off, I'm gonna say, probably Two of their best games in their careers. Well, considering Lamar Jackson went 29 from 32 in the second half, over 300 yards, we need to mention it. There's a chance he may never have a better second half of football in his career. Think of those stats. 29 from 32, over 300 yards, multiple touchdowns, massive fourth quarter deficit. Uh, Whatever questions people wanted to nitpick and ask about Lamar Jackson, he's just standing standing there with his arms folded and being like, have I not answered them all? Mm -hmm. What is left? Do people still want to criticize Lamar's arm? 
do they still want to say that he's just a running quarterback? Well, or they need a lead. They need a lead. They can't come back. They can't yeah. come back. Or even that he's just a dual threat. I think at this point, people, you almost have to consider that his throwing is as good as his running. He is a complete quarterback. Well, you could say that, except that he's the best runner of all time. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I don't know if he's the best throw. Yep. Time okay, yeah. In that, in that sense, for sure. But I think at this point, he can get the job done as, as well. Yeah. yeah. With his arms or with his legs. Yeah. I'll just ask, I'll phrase it in a question. Is this currently the best two quarterbacks in terms of form? Or who's in better form than, than Herbert and Lamar Jackson? Wow, yeah. Yeah, this is... Because Kyler Murray had an off week with San Francisco, may have picked up a bit of a shoulder injury. I'm a lefty, sorry. This would be Lamar. Yeah. I mean, this would be Kyler. Um, <laughs> Aaron Rodgers, he's been looking great on the field, doing enough to win games, but he's not popping off the screen the same way Herbert and Lamar... Jackson are just throwing it out there. It might be uh, the clash of the the number one and number two um, quarterbacks in the competition. Maybe going Josh into Allen. week six. Maybe Josh Allen as well deserves at least a mention. Yeah, yeah. But um, although they were winning, uh, the the biggest takeaway from their wins up until that win over Cleveland on the weekend was how good their defense was, mm -hmm. and Josh Allen doing enough to win. Um, Whereas Herbert and Lamar Jackson, I don't yeah. know if you can really fault those guys this season. In terms of non-quarterbacks in the MVP race, I do on this topic want to shout out Derek Henry. You're so cute. Who continues to do superhuman things. 640 yards in five games, seven touchdowns. His stats from year to year continue to get better. Average carries, yards, year on year, they're improving. If Derek Henry continues at this rate, for at least one to two more seasons, he will be the greatest running back of all time. Not related. Uh, Rosada or Wada affiliated with the NFL at all? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, you think uh, suspicious that he continues to get better? Or just it's just that he goes this way at this point of his career when historically, especially over the last 15 years, the fact that he is that size and that powerful and continues to get 30 to 50 handoffs a game and run over the top of people in every one of those handoffs. They just keep feeding him. The final game worth mentioning, I think, is the Cleveland Browns coming off the back of that devastating loss. They're at home this time to the Arizona Cardinals. Do the Cardinals lose their winnings? It, it feels like the Cardinals lose this game. Uh, it'll depend on, on the psyche of the Browns coming off a really tough loss where they feel like they should have won it. And although they scored 42 points, they kind of put it, put the game into the conservative section uh, of their playbook towards the end of that game versus the Chargers. Uh, I, I expect the Browns to win just because the Cardinals look like they're about to lose. Um, it's very hard to string... Obviously, for, for 31 teams, it was impossible to string five wins together, which is pretty wild. Um, but yeah, my my call of the week will be that there won't be any undefeated teams left after this week. Do you think this is a 14-7 Browns win or a 47-42 Browns win? The, it is going to be closer to that Chargers game than that Minnesota game, for sure. It's uh, a massive week. For Cleveland, and that's why I think they'll get it over the line because Cardinals lose this week. They're still number one in the in the best division in football, NFC West. Not just a massive week for Cleveland. It's a massive week for football, mate. I look forward to watching the games across the weekend. Hopefully now, with restrictions easing, we might even be able to watch a few games together at a pub, potentially, Ted. Okay. We'll keep that one in our diaries. Yeah, Thanks I'm sorry. No, I'm more... Okay, mate. I'll get excited about that. Let's yes. go. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot for your company, as always, Ted. It's been a blast. Likewise, buddy. Look forward to seeing you again next week. Go easy, everybody. Peace.